Okay, so next step is to look at RNA abundance. Um, the, the, the reason we're doing RNA-seq is we want a number associated with every gene to tell us how much a gene is expressed and whether it is expressed or not. And so that's kind of, we call it expression index to give you that number. And um, uh, you can see if originally you have a, a gene that expresses into an RNA, the RNA might have different copies, right? Uh, which means the gene is expressed at different levels. But then when you make that into a sequencing library, there are some steps which might influence how much read you will see on that gene. And so uh, this is just one example. Um, every color is one gene, another color is a different gene. You know, these are just, so, you know, for example, this gene is making two copies of an RNA, this gene is making one copy, this gene is only is making three copies of a gene, right? And uh, it depends on whether you sequence single end read or paired end read, you know, you, you sequence out the transcript. But what are the, if you, for example, uh, the, the number of count, so if you use Kij, which is a count of you know, whatever fragments that are aligned to the gene I for sample J, um, it's a number of factors would influence this. The first is the expression of this gene, right? That's the, the thing we do want to know. How much is this gene expressed? However, I hope you can see um, what, how many, if this gene is long, there will be more reads that can cover this region. So you will have more reads on this gene. It depends on how deep you sequence. This is related to comparing different samples. If one sample you only sequence 20 million reads, another sample you sequence 50 million reads, or maybe you did sequence 50 million reads for both, but after sequence alignment, one sample was able to map 90% of the reads, the other sample for some reason only had 5% mappability, then you may not really have enough coverage on, on those genes. Um, there might be some library preparation factors. For example, if you start from very little amount of RNA, say this is an embryo experiment, you have a, a, a three cell embryo, or sorry, not, not three, like a four, four cell embryo, right? So um, then you try to amplify enough RNA that you can make it into a sequencing library you have to PCR amplify your DNA a lot, right? So at that time, maybe there are additional uh, biases as well. And, uh, you know, there might be also some in silico factors, uh, such as uh, whether you use high set or star, you know, how do you deal with uh, things that are not uniquely mapped to the genome? But, but you can see there are a number of factors involved. And so over the years, people have tried to do different level of normalization in order to really reach a good expression index. And so the very simple thing you can imagine is just to, to, to normalize by sequencing depths. How many reads are mapped in this sample? How many reads are mapped in another sample? And so on. Sometimes people remove the redundant read. For example, if from sequencing, you do paired and read, you have two fragments that the beginning and the end are always identical. That's probably a PCR over amplification. You might want to remove that, right? Whereas if you have one end that's the same, the other end is different. That's probably coming from two copies of the transcript. You just by chance see the same end, but that's still okay. Um, but ideally, you know, the beginning and the end, all different land in this gene, that's really good quality read. But after you look at the reads that's mapped to the genome, you might just want to normalize by sequencing. And so um, when you send the sample to a facility for sequencing, they try to test the concentration of this tube of RNA and load as similar as possible, but there's never a guarantee. And so you might want to just normalize by the total life sequencing depths, right? That's the simplest one. And for many, many years, people use something called uh, RPKM. Uh, this is in the days when people were still sequencing on single end. Recently, when people are sequencing paired end, they use something called FPKM, which is fragment. Uh, this is read. Remember, every fragment has two reads. So in the early days when people only sequencing one end, you just do RPKM. And now when people are sequencing paired end, it's a fragment. So how many fragments? Um, and so the, 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 the experiment is done this way. So R RPKM stands for the number of reads per kilobase of transcript per millions of reads that sequence in this library. And so you try to normalize by your sequencing depths, 
but you also try to normalize based on the gene lens because remember the longer genes will have more reads and so you try to do this and so this is what's done for many years you get your total reads you divide it by million uh, yeah because you want to first normalize your library size uh, divided by millions. I remember early days we were sequencing, say, maybe 3 million. Later we did 20 million, but you always divide by a million. Um, and then you divide each, you divide the read landed on each gene by the gene length in kilobase. You know, if this gene or transcript is 3 kb long, you divide it by 3. Uh, or, yeah, so, um, three, yeah, 3,000. Um, and this way, basically, you correct for coverage of the library, you also correct for gene lens. And some of these early algorithms, they do use this approach. But um, uh, later on, an uh, algorithm called RSAM was developed where they use uh, something called transcript per million. And they proposed this TPM approach, which later on uh, was determined to be a more accurate measure of gene expression. And you look at this, they, they divide the, the, the read count on each gene by the length of the gene or the length of the transcript first. Then they divide by the scaling factor uh, by the sequencing depth of one million. Um, you're kind of like, yeah, they, they also normalize by the gene length. They also normalize by the library, but the order is different. Um, and interestingly, this is, considered to be more accurate. Um, they, they, this algorithm is able to get the final, you know, the TPM value that you get the, the proportion of the reads that are mapped to a gene in different samples are now more comparable when you calculate, you know, differential level of expression. So, um, by the way, this is shamelessly still from uh, Josh Starmer's uh, slides. I actually just, uh, screen captured from his video. Uh, but it's a really, really good example of how RPKM is different from TPM. So supposedly you have three samples. You know, this is actually, say, replicate or three conditions. It doesn't matter. You have three samples and you have four genes. This is just, of course, a very, very simple case. And in, you know, after read mapping, we, oh, oh by the way, uh, algorithms such as RSAM, you also get transcript annotation. They will know they will take a BAM file, they take the annotation, they will know how many reads are mapped to some genes, right? So uh, then they'd say, okay, gene one has 10 reads in the first sample and 12 reads in the second sample and 30 reads from the third sample and so on. But if you look at the total reads very quickly, you realize uh, this sample is sequenced more than the first, first sample, right? And so in order to normalize the, the sequencing depths, you divide Normally, you divide by millions of reads, but with this baby example, we just divide by tens of reads. So you divide 10, and so this is 3.4, so 3.5, uh, 4.5, 10.6, right? So that's the scaling factor. And um, after you divide each of these original uh, value by 3.5, the 12 by 4.5, you know, this 30 by 10.6, this is the value you are gonna get. And so it's kind of scaled by the, the millions of reads, or in this case, tens of reads. And so with this, uh, the next thing you do is you normalize by the, the sequencing, uh, sorry, the, the, the gene lens. Okay, so uh, now this is after you scale by the library desk, you now look at the transcript lens. So gene A is 2 kb, so you divide 2.86 by two, you get 1.4. Uh, the second gene is 4 kb, you know, 5.71 divided by 4 kb is 1.43 and so on. So at the end, you get something like this, um, which roughly look okay, sorry, roughly look okay. You can see here originally, right, these two, this is a 2 kb gene, you have 10 reads, 4 kb gene, you have 20 reads, 1 kb gene, you have five reads. After you normalize, you realize, yeah, these genes are expressed at the same level, right, because they are just different lengths. And you try to normalize by the library depths looks pretty good. That's why for many, many years, people use this with fragment, with paired end, you just do FPKM because it's, it's both ends and in the same transcript, right? So it's, it's. But then uh, TPM is a different normalization. So this is still the same original data. The first thing you do is you normalize by the gene lens. And so the, yeah, so uh, 10 divided by two, 20 divided by four, five divided by one, you can see already that this is, 
yeah, so the, you can already see that these three genes are actually expressed at the same level. After the gene normalization, then you you sum up the this gene normalized reads into the to, to to sum them up and then divided by in this case ten. But normally you do a million. Um, and so now the scaling factor is 1.5, 2.025, and 4.51, which you divide from the original, not the original, from this value. And so 5 divided by 1.5, you get 3.33. Uh, and yeah, so 6 divided by 2.25, you, yeah, you get these numbers. And you can still see that in the first sample, uh, ABC genes are expressed at similar levels, and also in the third sample, these ABC genes are expressed at similar levels. And so you're kind of wondering, wait, what is the difference between this? One does the read depth normalization first, and then look at the genes. The other one, look at the, the normalized by the gene depths first, and then uh, look at the library depths. Um, and interestingly, after you finish all this normalization, you are kind of wondering what is the total amount of, so what is the total amount of expression I see from this cell? When you sum them up, you might notice that in the first sample and second and third, they don't even sum up to the same number. Whereas uh, in, the, in the TPM value at the very end, when you sum them up, you know, because you think you, you want to say that the, the, the you make an assumption that the cells are expressing the total amount of expression at similar level, right? That's how you can do comparisons. And interestingly with TPM, yes, they do sum up to the same number. And that's how you can come, I think you can compare the expression levels between the different samples better. Okay. And so nowadays, uh, most people believe the TPM value is a more accurate measure of the gene index or quantification abundance. Okay, and RSAM is the first algorithm that proposed this approach and over the years it's been acknowledged that this is a pretty good uh, algorithm. And so what you input is a FASTQ file uh, or you can also, if, if you can already use STAR to do the uh, mapping, it's fine. So if you didn't, it, actually RSAM will just use STAR to do mapping to gather them. You need a reference transcript annotation file. So, you, so Basically, after you know that this read is mapped to this location, the transcript annotation roughly says uh, reads that are mapped to this location belong to the same gene or the same transcript, right? So you can get the gene level or the transcript level expression. And so what it outputs is the transcript level uh, gene expression. In fact, on that transcript, it will give you a number of readouts. Uh, one is the read count. How many reads really landed in this in this transcript, it's a raw count without any without normalization. Uh, TPM is the correct expression index, uh, but because a lot of people are used to looking at FPKM, uh, RSAM also give you that readout. Although um, I think more and more people rely on this TPM readout now. And so this is calculated. Every line uh, is one different transcript, and you get a quantification level. Um, and one. Uh, and, and this is actually calculated on the effective transcript lens, um, which is not the full lens of the whole transcript. So remember here, we are trying to normalize the, the, the read count landed in this gene by the gene lens. The, the reality is you can see here, when you look at how reads are covering the genes, uh, the beginning and the end, very often you don't have very good coverage. And so if you have a very short gene, the, the region that can be covered is much, much shorter. And so the effective lens is uh, if this gene or the transcript is this long, and this is the average fragment lens, you subtract this uh, plus one. So that kind of normalize out the end a little bit. And so you, when you, at the end, you normalize by the, the, the lens is the effective lens of the transcript. So that's you know, slightly different. But this is all factored in, in the algorithm. Um, and uh, one thing is for one gene, sometimes you can get different isoforms. For example, uh, this gene might have three axons, but it might have three different isoforms. Uh, say in one isoform is using axon one and two, Another isoform is just like it splice out so that it only use axon two and three. And the third case is using uh, uh, axon one and three. What you will see is, you know, reads that lands in here. And sometimes there are reads that lands in the junction. 
the, the reset lands in the junction, you clearly know where it belongs to, right? The, the, but then the ones that only lands in axon one, in this case, you have to decide, is it coming from this transcript or the th third transcript, right? You have to assign it to a place. And uh, uh, the, um, the, the, the RSAM algorithm will do kind of a maximum likelihood of observing this. And so basically, iteratively estimates the, this transcript abundance. And based on the estimated transcript ab abundance, decide whether to assign this read to one isoform or the other isoform. Um, so if, if reads that are unambiguous, then you always know, for example, if you see an axon one to two, then definitely this belongs to isoform one. But for the, uh, for the um, ambiguous ones, it will be based on the currently estimated abundance to assign it. And so um, we won't go to the specific algorithm detail, but I want to kind of show you an intuitive example. Um, for example, you, you have this one gene. You can see it has many potential uh, exons that can be spliced into different forms, right? Um, and then this is the situation. You see the RNA-seq reads that map to uh, the, this gene in the brain and muscle and liver uh, tissues. And the red and blue are just reads from positive strand or negative strand. Um, and so you can see uh, if you have a, is like um, some regions that are unique to one sample, then that's a really easy to assign. For example, you look at this region. That's only in, the, 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 in, in one type of transcript, right? So you first try to assign those that are unambiguous because they are only covered by one uh, transcript. Or if you have a junction that's unambiguous, it has to go to one axon or sorry, go to one isoform, you, you do that. Um, and the remaining ones, you can just kind of base on the, 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 the rest of them, try to proportionally distribute them. And so in this case, you know, if you have a read that lands in here, it can either, uh, oh, sorry, um, in this case, if you have a read that lands in here, you know for sure it's the first isoform. And so uh, in this case, you can see, because we see a lot of reads here, and this in, in brain, we predicted that most of the genes are, are transcribed using this first isoform. And the second, you see, the, the second would have read around here, but you don't see a lot of reads, therefore it's a pretty low number. And after these two, you don't really have much on the third left, and it gives a zero, right? Whereas in the muscle, we do see a lot of reads in here, and so you suspect that this second isoform is a lot, and then, uh, yeah, be, because you don't see many reads in here, you believe that the first and third are kind of pretty low. And so on. Okay, that's the intuition. Yes, question. Uh, so, question is: Can you have reads that map to different genes? Normally, no, because um, remember we start from RNA, and usually the same RNA is only from the same gene, and then you just fragment and you sequence, right? That's usually shouldn't cross over to another gene. The only case you see one read that's crossing different genes is because you have a gene fusion. The genome has a rearrangement translocation. Then this RNA is coming up as one fusion. Okay, you do see cases when one read can cover two or three or even four axons if the axons are short. That's okay, right? Um, and so, uh, so for many years, people use uh, STAR to do the read mapping, and they use RSAM to get the gene expression index. But um, in 2016 and 2017, you can see there are two papers published. It's a similar idea. Um, remember, BW and Bowtie also are published around the same time and also use similar idea. And whether people use one or the other, sometimes it's just personal preference. They are quite similar. and so. Uh, for, for this one, these two algorithms also came up around the same time. What they have is called pseudo-alignment. You start from the FASTQ file, uh, but then instead of aligning it, remember the regular BAM, you just need to know the genome sequence. It mapped the axon and it creates the junction, but that takes a lot of time. And so we don't really, so in, in Caliso and Salmon, it's like, oh, if we already know that most of, I would say, if you look at any tissue, 95%, 
of the transcript should be known annotated. If you have 5%, you know, depending on uh, what the application is, for example, if you only sequence 20 million reads, uh, you want to know some, you know, samples, how much the gene is expressed, you don't really need to care about fusion transcript, mutations, or uh, splicing, or, or, or novel genes. Uh, you can just directly create an index, which only takes the known transcript annotation. So remember, uh, it's, it's almost like a BWA, but then only on the, on the known transcript, which is about 1%, 1 to 2% of the genome. So instead of mapping all the, the reads to all the introns and between the genes and to find where they come from, Callisto and Salmon, it, take, it, it creates an index of just all the known genes and you know, where they are. And then when you have the FASTQ file, they very quickly find just a mapping to the known transcript locations. And then they will give you uh, the abundance uh, of or expression index. And it also does the estimation of um, if, if there are multiple isoform different transcripts from the same gene, it also finds the relative uh, concentration of the different transcripts for the same gene that are compatible with the read you see. Um, in addition, uh, Salmon does a little bit of sequence specific or GC correction because sometimes if you have a sample that has somehow, somehow this sequencing machine sequence GC better than others, it's been very well known that a sequencing machines at the ability to PCR, I guess the, even library preparation, the ability to amplify RNA depends on your GC content, and the ability to read it out in sequencing depends on the GC content. And so depending on the run, you might have some GC biases as well. And so Simon does a little bit of GC bias. But in general, these algorithms are much, much faster. So in homework one, uh, you are asked to do uh, BWA read mapping. You will see in homework two, we'll do RNA-seq mapping. Whether you use star or salmon, the speed is hugely different. Uh, with salmon, you can map 10 million reads in a few minutes. Uh, you can do this in, even in, on your laptop, which is really quite nice. But you will not, you know, there will be some reads that map to novel genes or novel junctions. You just did, didn't bother. I would say with this, you are maybe 20 times faster and you get 90% the information already, which is pretty good, right? So um, the actual index, or sorry, the output, uh, whether you use RSAM or Callisto and Salmon, they are all quite similar now. Um, you get these, um, you can see the one is TSV, one is SF, and they all have the, this is the ensemble ID. So this every gene or every transcript have an ID. Uh, this is the lens, and this is the effective lens, uh, which reduce the, you know, the, the, the total gene lens by the, the read the lens a little bit. And this is the, uh, the estimated count, which, uh, which is the the read that land in there uh, in 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 here per per million of reads, and so this is like three point seven. This is yeah three point three seven. You can see they are quite similar, and this is the final TPM value, which is you know now what we considered as the good readout for gene expression. So the, I guess the difference is just these two algorithms. The last two columns are swapped, and uh, but if you look at their estimate, they are slightly different but there might be some small differences okay but i think if you use either of these algorithms it, you'll be fine the, the most accurate one is still star rsam but if you want to get something very quick you can do either callisto or salmon all right questions for quantification uh, yes I see. The question is so, um, whether people consider point mutations that's coming from the read. Uh, it's true 
PCR can potentially create a point mutation. So that's why um, you probably do not want to consider the same fragment if the left end and right end are exactly the same that reads multiple times, because if there is a PCR bias, you will see it repeatedly. In order to really call a mutation at the end, you need to have different read. You know, like basically they all cover this region, but some are here, some are there, you know, then they, if they, you always see this, then you know it's not coming from PCR bias. You see this even from DNA sequencing as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. 